Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining in this program. My name is Jim Morgan, and I am the author of Six Miles from Charleston, Five Minutes to Hell. It's a new book on the Battle of Secessionville. Uh, came out just in October, published by Savas Beattie, part of the Emerging Civil War series. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight, and then hopefully uh, take uh, try to answer any questions that you might have. Secessionville, curious kind of a name. Uh, a lot of people might actually be forgiven for thinking that Secessionville was really just a nickname for Charleston, uh, cradle of secession and all of that. Uh, in fact, Secessionville was a little village. <clears throat> it's a subdivision today on James Island, one of quite a few subdivisions. But it was a little village uh, that was created by some folks in Charleston who decided they wanted some some houses kind of up at the head of uh, what's called Clark Sound. They figured the weather would be better, a little bit less problem with, uh, well, a little bit easier to get sea breezes. Not quite sure, but in any case, it was organized as a, a, a kind of a real estate development, really. Came a little village. The name is kind of um, curious, and no one really knows exactly when the name Secessionville was first used. There are some sources that imply it actually predates the Civil War by several years. Most seem to assume that it really just comes from around the time of, of uh, actual secession. Doesn't really matter, uh, but it is kind of an interesting name. The campaign that was launched on James Island on June 2nd, 1862, started out with the idea that the Federals were going to, to uh, land on James Island and then make a kind of a lightning dash across the island, take what's called Fort Johnson from the rear. Controlling Fort Johnson, which is right on Charleston Harbor, would have allowed the Federals essentially to control Charleston. It, it, taking Fort Johnson basically meant the fall of Charleston. And this is June of 1862. But let me back up a little bit uh, to give you an idea of where it all came from. The Federals needed a Navy base somewhere along the South Atlantic coast. They had one in Virginia, uh, Fortress Monroe, Norfolk, Hampton Roads area there uh, was a usable base. But the next one south of that, that the Federals controlled that was a usable base was in Key West. Was that a thousand miles or so? It's quite a distance. In any case, they wanted something else and they took a look at the coast of South Carolina. And uh, you can look at map number one and you will see on map number one, basically the whole coast uh, from Charleston all the way down to Savannah. Part of map number one shows Port Royal Sound, a little closer to Savannah than it is to Charleston. Uh, it's um, protected on two sides by Fort Walker and Fort Beauregard. Those are fairly clear on the, on the map. The Confederates were in the process of building those forts and arming them when the Federals decided to launch the attack. This attack took place on the 7th of November, 1861. Uh, and it consisted of rather a large fleet. At the time, it was the largest armada that the United States Navy had ever put together. 14 warships and 63 supply vessels were down there to take and hold uh, Port Royal Sound, turn it into a base. Port Royal Sound is near the town of Beaufort. Well, actually, Beaufort is right on the Sound. Beaufort, South Carolina. Not to be confused with Beaufort, North Carolina, which is spelled the same way, B-E-A-U. Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, some people will recognize that that's the area where Hilton Head Island is today. It's a resort. And right across Port Royal Sound is another area that some of us are familiar with. Many people are not. And that's Paris, Island, South Carolina. Uh, the old Marines out there, like myself, will remember Paris Island, I'm sure. In any case, on November 7th, the uh, U.S. Navy shows up under the command of Flag Officer DuPont. And he is going to put together a fairly simple, straightforward plan to take Port Royal Sound. Uh, the uh, line of ships, of warships, sails in uh, with the tide going up the right side of the channel on the Fort Beauregard side. They fire at Fort Beauregard. They get up in the channel a bit. They loop back around, come to the other side, fire on Fort Walker, and then they make that loop three times, firing on each fort that they're closest to and, of course, being fired on. These forts were not very well armed. There were a total of 39 guns in the two forts, but they, it, it's unlikely that even half of them could have done any damage to the ships had they even managed to hit them. And the Confederate marksmanship was incredibly poor at this point. So the, new, the uh, Union warships just sailed in, 
turned around and sailed out, made that loop three times in something around four hours and basically forced the evacuation of all three of those forts. When that was done, Union had secured uh, the forts. They moved in all the supply vessels, and which included some 12,000 troops. These are the troops, many of them, who later will fight at Secessionville uh, on the 16th of June, 1862. But their purpose at this point was simply to be a garrison for the Navy base that was going to be established, was established uh, there on Port Royal Sound in, in Beaufort. At that point, there was no really thought of using these troops to take Charleston, and then certainly the whole Secessionville thing was, was well in the future. That's um, That map, map one, will give you a good idea of the lay of the land all the way from Charleston to uh, Savannah, including the route of the Charleston and Savannah Railroad, which turned out to be considerably less important than you might think, because the Federals were not really interested in it. Uh, Robert E. Lee, who was the Confederate commander at the time, was really quite afraid that the Federals were going to come in and break up that railroad, because it was the only way he had to, to keep his troops mobile. The Federals had the Navy. He had no Navy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but he had the railroad. And uh, he wanted very much to, to, to protect it. Nobody in the federal high command, with the exception of Brigadier General Isaac Stevens, seemed the least bit interested in the railroad. That was a break for Lee. All right. They get everything done here. This is late 1861 into early 1862. The Federals are basically just getting settled. There's a little fighting uh, in January of 1862. It doesn't really amount to a whole lot. Um, it just settles both sides in place. And they had a kind of status quo that involved occasionally the federal troops trying to move inland a bit. But as soon as they got out of the range of the Navy's big guns, the Confederates would move in and push them back. And then every time the Confederates tried to advance and push the Federals back even farther, they would get within the range of the Navy's big guns, which would then force them back. So basically, if you look at the, um, the Navy as playing a critical role here, it really created a kind of status quo with each side more or less sitting in place after a while and, and uh, not doing a whole lot to the other. All right. And then comes May of 1862. Something rather important happens in May. It's called, usually referred to around here as the Great Escape. There was a slave named Robert Smalls. Smalls had been uh, working as a sailor, a deckhand, uh, on ships uh, around the coast and particularly in Charleston Harbor for some time. He was 23 years old and had become quite an effective, rather efficient boat handler. He had learned navigation. Uh, he knew essentially everything there was to know about handling boats. And he was the helmsman and essentially the chief crewman, at least the chief black crewman, on a 150-foot shallow draft steamer called the Planter which the Confederates were using. Uh, it was not a, a CS ship. Uh, it was a privately owned ship that had been leased to the Confederates for hauling supplies around Charleston Harbor and in the swampy areas, uh, the shallow areas. That was very good for that 150 foot long side wheel steamer. The captain was a fellow named Charles Relier. Relier and two white crewmen were essentially the officers on board this ship. And then there were seven or eight black crewmen, deckhands, and working the engines and so on. Uh, they, their senior was Robert Smalls. On May the 12th, Robert Smalls decided that he was going to put into effect a plan that he had been thinking about for a while because Captain Relier had a bad habit. He would, uh, whenever the planter was docked at one of its war, it had a wharf up on the Cooper River known as the Southern Wharf. Uh, that was its usual docking place. And at night, Captain Relier and the two white crewmen would go ashore and spend the night with their families. This was specifically against Confederate naval orders. All ships were supposed to be under the control all times of a white officer. Relier ignored this, and he left the ship in charge of Robert Smalls. Smalls knew this was going to happen, and so he made plans for May the 12th to be the date when he was going to take advantage of this and uh, was going to make his escape. Captain Relier went ashore. The two white uh, crewmen went ashore, leaving the boat in Smalls's control. About three o'clock in the morning, Smalls woke everybody up and said, all right, let's go. And they, the other guys were in on this. Uh, they start getting the boilers fired up. 
making arrangements to with the lines, getting the ship prepared to sail. And they did this without any attempt at secrecy. They just went about it in the normal way as if this were a normal procedure for them at this time. The guards on the wharfs assumed that that's what they were doing. So nobody bothered them, nobody challenged them. And he was very lucky, Smalls was, in this regard, because throughout this whole escape, uh, he knew what he was doing so well, and he did everything so perfectly according to uh, the, the procedures. Nobody ever challenged him. So he gets his men up. They get the boat out, raise the Confederate flag. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. They back out of the slip. They go upriver a few hundred yards to another slip where they are met by Smalls' wife, his two children, and the wives and families of several of the other slaves. They get these people on board, get them hidden, and then the, the boat proceeds downriver. Cooper River out into Charleston Harbor. They go past Castle Pinckney. They go past Fort Johnson. Smalls is, is uh, giving the appropriate signals each time. And then they get to right up there at Fort Sumter. Now there's a channel, of course, between Sumter and Moultrie. The Confederates had blocked most of it off. There was a narrow channel right up under the guns of Fort Sumter. Smalls has put on a kind of a long duster and a wide brimmed hat, which everyone knew belonged to Captain Relier. And it's dark enough that they couldn't tell if he was black or white. They just saw kind of a silhouette. He goes in, he gives the appropriate signals. The guard on top of the wall of Fort Sumter gives him a friendly wave and out they go into the ocean, into the Atlantic Ocean. He turns the boat over. He's of course challenged by the, by the Federal Navy. Uh, he he uh, heaves to, surrenders, turns the boat over to the Navy. And uh, from that point, uh, he's a he's a free man. Uh, they immediately send him, they being the Navy, send Smalls and the planter down to uh, Port Royal, where Flag Officer DuPont is headquartered. And DuPont, or rather Smalls, brings DuPont a great deal of very useful military information about the numbers of Confederate troops. Uh, he tells the Union forces that the Confederates have been sending regiments away to uh, Virginia and other places. And this is true. The General Pendle, Pendle excuse me, Pendleton, who's, no, Pemberton, sorry, who is in command of the Confederates at this point has had to send off some eight regiments of troops. And they have withdrawn quite a few artillery pieces from the Stono River. They had a bunch lined up along the Stono in various places. The Stono is kind of a back door to Charleston Harbor, but they were consolidating their forces. They moved guns away from the Stono and they, the Federals hadn't known this until Smalls told them. This is May the 13th that he's doing this. The Federals immediately begin to check it out. They send boats to check uh, up the river to check on this. They determine that all this information is correct. Um, take a look at map number two. This will give you a bit of a closer up look uh, at Charleston Harbor. And you also see the Stone River. Uh, it's on the right side of the map. You'll see a whole bunch of numbers there marking positions that are uh, spots in uh, in Charleston Harbor. But along the Stono River, you see numbers one, two, and then four farther up the Stono River. Number three is actually the Secessionville Peninsula. One and two were forts that had been manned and armed by the Confederates. The guns were now gone, and the Federals realized this. So they begin thinking about, well, maybe we can actually use this force that we've got here uh, to take Charleston. On May the 17th, Brigadier General Henry Benham, who was under the command of General David Hunter. Hunter was the overall commander of uh, the Department of the South, essentially. It included all of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. But the Northern District or Northern Division of that department was under the command of General Henry Benham. Benham submitted to Hunter a plan to take Charleston. And it called basically for the Navy to sail up the Stono River. And if you look on that map, map number two, you'll see the Stono River. And they were going to land troops right at point number two, which was called Fort Pickens by the Confederates, not to be confused with Fort Pickens in Pensacola, uh, generally referred to just as the old fort. Federals were going to land troops there and have those troops, along with some other troops, uh, who were going to march across John's Island. You follow to the left, you'll see Legreeville. Looks like Laguerreville. It's pronounced Legree. Legreeville, right across the Stono River from the old fort. Legreeville is on John's Island. You had two divisions of federal troops here, one under the command of Horatio Wright, whose men were down at uh, Edisto Island, 
and then Seabrook Island. They were going to cross over to Seabrook, march across Seabrook, all the way across Johns Island, and come to the village of Legreeville, where they were then going to be ferried across the river uh, in support of the other division under the command of Isaac Stevens. Those two forces, a total of about 7,000 men, were then going to make this lightning strike across James Island. And if, if you follow, you will see number eight on the map, right there on Charleston Harbor. They were going to strike across there, take Fort Johnson from the rear. And from that point, basically with the long range rifle guns that the Federals were, were going to be able to put there, they would have controlled Charleston Harbor. That was the plan. It didn't work. It didn't even come close to working. Um, mainly because it started to rain. This landing did take place. The two divisions, uh, well, actually, Isaac Stevens' division did land just across from Legreeville on June 2nd. The plan had initially called for Horatio Wright's division to move all the way across Johns Island to Legreeville and then be ferried across in a day. But because on June 2nd, it started to rain, and pretty much continued to rain for oh, the better part of a week and a half. Um, everything got slowed down. The troops under General Stevens had come by sea. They were landed on June 2nd. Didn't matter that it was, it actually didn't start to rain until after they got there. Uh, but they are now stationed on James Island, waiting for Horatio Wright's troops to show up. But because of the rain, everything turned into, this turned into a a kind of South Carolina version of Burnside's mud march. Everything was bogged down. And you had, if you look at that map, number two, you see how John's Island, fairly extensive, and troops were going to be stretched out on the roads all the way across from roughly Seabrook Island all the way across to Legreeville. This, this division under General Horatio Wright was strung out. They were bogged down in the mud and in the swampy area. It was pouring down rain. Uh, the supplies had not kept up with the marching of the troops, so many of these men went without food for a couple of days. The only water that they had was what they could collect from rainwater. So this completely throws the timetable off, and it is ultimately what caused this idea of taking Fort Johnson from the rear to uh, not only fail, but to not really be tried. It wasn't until June 5th that Horatio Wright's men got to Legreeville soaked, exhausted, hungry, and they spent four days there. They didn't actually cross over until June 9th. So that's the whole time. By then, everything was supposed to have been done, of course, with the Federals in possession of, of Fort Johnson. With Horatio Wright's men slogging across John's Island, uh, June 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, Isaac Stevens' men actually saw some action. Uh, much of the action was in the rain, but they did see some action. You see where the Union troops, 79th New York, known as the Highlanders, the 100th Pennsylvania, known as the Roundheads, have advanced from the landing site. This is on the morning of June 3rd, a couple of miles inland to the Legree Farm. Now, there were a number of Legree Farms. The Legree family was fairly prolific, and, and there were a number of spots on the, in the area uh, where the Legrees had farmhouses. This is just one. They go to, they being the Federals, go up to the Legree Farm to a place where the road makes a sharp left turn and becomes the entrance to a causeway that goes across the marsh, across the swamp, uh, and comes out near the river's house. If you look at map number three, you see the river's house up at the top right-hand corner <clears throat> uh, near the northern end of that causeway. So the Federals are coming in doing this. It's just a... Um, patrol. They're just going to see what's out there. But they run into these troops from the 1st South Carolina, 24th South Carolina. Eventually, they all come together and have a fight. But what the, the Federals first do when they get up to the Legree House is send the 28th Massachusetts forward. 28th Mass eventually will become part of the Irish Brigade. Uh, at this point, they're, they're part of Isaac Stevens' division. 28th Mass goes up, approaches the causeway. They get up out into the swamp. They see these other troops, these Confederate troops uh, from the 24th South Carolina and then later the 1st South Carolina. And the Federals back there at the Legree House are waiting to see what happens. They cannot see. There are lots of, uh, there's a, a heavy tree line up there. And they finally see the 28th Massachusetts come running back through the tree line. 
and being shot at. So they form a battle line. And then these other troops, the 24th South Carolina, 1st South Carolina, come out, advance across the tree line. They attack the Union position and eventually drive them back. They actually capture uh, 21 or 22 men from the 100th Pennsylvania. Those guys become the first prisoners of war in this. This is all on June 3rd, taking place uh, in the late morning and early afternoon. Now, the reason that the Confederates were there Federals had just come on a patrol. They had been on, on uh, James Island there for a day. They're moving forward a little bit just to see what's out in front of them. The reason the Confederates came was to retrieve some guns that had been lost. Captain Charles Chichester of the Gist Guard had come down a couple of days before to put some guns in place in the marsh on a hidden position with which to ambush the Federals. They knew they were coming. That didn't work because the Federals got there more quickly than he thought. He found himself almost cut off. The Federals did not discover him because he was pretty well hidden. Um, but he wasn't that far away from them and he knew he had to get out. So the night of June 2nd, he tries to move his troops back quietly with the guns across the causeway. Well, in the process of getting to the cause across the causeway in the first place and then getting back across the causeway, he loses three of his four guns. They simply slide off this slick, muddy, wet, wooden, narrow causeway into the marsh. And they can't get them out, they're heavy. And they can't maneuver these guns to get them lifted up and back on out. So they go on back to their camp. The next day, the Confederates decide, well, we're gonna come down and retrieve these guns. They didn't know the Federals were coming out on a patrol. So that's why these two forces run into each other. They have this fight, the Confederates do attack, eventually push the Federals back, capture some prisoners and they leave. So the fight's essentially a draw because while the Confederates get the best of it tactically, they abandon the field and they do not achieve their mission, which was to retrieve the guns. From June 3rd, for several days, the uh, men of Isaac Stevens Division are still waiting for the men of Horatio Wright's division. These guys are still slogging across Johns Island. It's raining. And uh, as I said before, it's uh, a very, very slow process. The rain becomes critically important here. And I want to read a few quotes from some of the men, soldiers on both sides, to give you an idea of just how much it was raining. Quotes from both Union and Confederate troops. A New York soldier described the wind blowing a gale and the rain coming down in torrents. Colonel Johnson Haygood, Confederate commander, reported that one of his pickets was asked by a half-drowned Yankee picket, I say, does it ever get dry in this country? Commodore DuPont wrote to his wife that during this time, this, this extended storm, the ships dragged their anchors, and for June, it seemed quite a violent gale. One Connecticut boy wrote, I have not had a damned rag of dry clothing on me for the last two weeks. A Confederate soldier described the rainstorms as a perfect deluge of water. The roads are terribly boggy and muddy and the earth like so much slush. A Union artilleryman wrote, We lay nights between the cotton rows, sometimes only our heads out of water. One of the 79th New York uh, Highlanders wrote, Whew, how sour and moldy everything about our tents smelled. And then finally, a New Hampshire soldier writes, the rains descended and the floods came and it really seemed as if it had never rained before. No one except the initiated can understand how fast the rain falls at the south in a violent storm. And this went on for a week and a half. So you can imagine um, how everything got bogged down and, and interfered with the plans of both sides. Next few days, basically Isaac Stevens' men are just waiting. Horatio Wright's men are slogging their way across the island. They finally get to Legreeville on the 5th of June. They don't cross over until the 9th of June. And on the 10th of June, then a couple of things begin to happen. First of all, it stops raining for a while. For the better part of the day, it stops raining. Now, at this point, the Federals have established their camps. If you look at map number five, you'll see the locations of the Confederate camps. Isaac Stevens' camps along Battery Island Road. You're looking on the, on the lower part of the map uh, near the Legree House. You've got a couple of batteries, Battery Williams and Battery Stevens, which the Federals have established uh, pretty much in the marsh. And then up above that, you'll see Battery Wright and to the left of Battery Wright, the camps of Horatio Wright's division. 
up near the Grimble Plantation. And then you can see up in the upper right-hand corner uh, where all the Confederate camps are. All right, let's go back to map number four, because there was a fight just away from the Grimble Plantation, Grimble's Landing on the 10th of June. And that becomes a very critical fight. It's small, it's a Union victory, um, tactical victory, but it becomes a strategic Confederate victory, as you'll see. Horatio Wright had established his camps up there on the Grimble Plantation. And you'll see a line of uh, troops, which he had established, 47th New York, 45th Pennsylvania, the 97th Pennsylvania, and part of Company E of the 3rd U.S. Artillery. Ahead of those troops, you'll see a dotted line that shows a detachment of the 47th New York. That's a half a mile or so up ahead along that road. Now, that road is called the King's Highway. Today, most of it is known as Fort Johnson Road because it goes directly to Fort Johnson. The Confederates understood this. They understood this was uh, a critical roadway. They had troops all along it and they were gonna do what they could to keep the Federals from advancing on it. One of the things that was decided at the time was let's attack the Yanks. So on the morning or actually the afternoon of June 10th, the, the Confederates advanced with the troops that you see on map number four, the 47th Georgia to the left of the road, the King's Highway, the first South Carolina to the right, followed up by the fourth Louisiana Battalion in reserve. The way this worked, because everything was wet uh, and because the only places where there was any visibility with, with this was right along the road. There were thick woods on both sides of the road all along this, this, uh, this King's Highway. 47 Georgia and the 1st South Carolina started out next to each other on opposite sides of the road, but the 47th is moving faster than the 1st South Carolina. The way the woods work, they get tangled up and slow down. So when the 47th Georgia first breaks out of that tree line, into an open field, which the Federals can see, they're by themselves. And they make an attack on the pickets. They, they fire on the pickets. That 47th uh, New York detachment falls back. The Confederates apparently interpret that as a general withdrawal and they advance, but it's only the 47th Georgia by itself with the other guys still hung up behind them. Uh, they come upon the main Federal line. They attack, 47th Georgia does, and they are repulsed heavily, heavy, uh, with heavy losses, a number of um, uh, probably 60 to 70 total casualties. We know the Federals buried 16 Confederates from that initial assault uh, later on in the day. Uh, the 47th fell back, regrouped, tried it again, got repulsed a second time, and then eventually all the Confederates fell back because by then it's, it, it starts late in the afternoon and it's dark and they all fall back. Now there's some I said this was a tactical Union victory, but a strategic Confederate victory because the fighting here caused General Hunter, David Hunter, to basically lose faith in the whole operation. Uh, he, he had lost patience anyway because this thing that was supposed to be a lightning strike on June 2nd or 3rd, now it's June 10th and nothing has happened. Everybody's bogged down. And Hunter is in trouble not so much because of the slowness of this movement, he's in political trouble. David Hunter, as you may know, was known primarily for two things. One was an emancipation proclamation that he issued early on in his tenure as commander down there, basically saying that all the, all the slaves were free. This was something that Lincoln was not ready to do. Lincoln rescinds the order. Now, Hunter should have known better because he had been out in Missouri when General Fremont was out there earlier uh, the previous year, and had issued his emancipation decree. Not only did Lincoln rescind that decree, but he fired Fremont and replaced him in command with none other than David Hunter. So Hunter really should have known that it was not a good idea to prematurely issue these emancipation edicts. Nonetheless, he does so on, um, I believe it's May the 9th of uh, 1862. On May the 19th, Lincoln rescinds that order. But so far, he has not relieved Hunter. Hunter's concerned about this. There are all sorts of rumors going around Washington and the newspapers that Hunter's about to be relieved and replaced with his subordinate, General Benham. Hunter's worried about the whole situation. And then this thing happens on June 10th. They're near the Grimble Plantation. His men drive the Confederates back, but Hunter becomes scared of the whole thing. He thinks there are a lot more Confederates there than there really are. 
fairly typical federal response to things here, particularly early in the war. Um, he, he believes that they never would have attacked him in the first place if they didn't have superior numbers. He loses faith. I think he loses his nerve. It's a, you might say it's a little bit like Hooker at Chancellorsville. He, he backs off. He informs General Benham at this point that he is going to leave. He's going to go back to his headquarters near Hilton Head in Port Royal Sound. He's going to leave Benham in charge. But he gives Benham specific orders. You will not advance on Charleston. You will not advance on Fort Johnson. You can fight insofar as it's necessary to protect your camps. The camps are there and uh, the, they have a perimeter around the camps. Uh, but that's all that Benham is going to be allowed to do. And on the 12th, leaves. Uh, there, there are a lot of jokes made about, about that. A lot of people say, well, he just went because he wanted to see his wife. And he goes back and she's at, at Hilton Head back there and he's going to go see her. But in fact... If you, if you look at the overall situation, he was concerned about his command. He probably figured he could do more about it, better communications from his headquarters than he could there on James Island. Uh, he had pretty much realized that this, this quick strike across the island is not going to happen. Uh, he's concerned now about increased uh, Confederate numbers, which they don't have, but he thinks they do. And so he goes back on the 12th. The federal, I'm sorry, the Confederates have been attacking these camps, Benham's camps, the divisions of Wright and Stevens, particularly Wright, they're up closer to him. And Benham has been given permission to protect his camps. He decides that the best way to do that is to attack what's called the Tower Battery. Look again at map number five. If you follow the road from the river inland, you'll see the, the two black arrows which mark the eventual advance routes of Wright's division from Grimble's and Stevens's division from Battery Island Road. They converge on the Tower Battery, which is essentially Secessionville. The Tower Battery is a, uh, it was named such because the Confederates had built 75 foot tower, uh, something like a, like a fire tower, fire watch tower that uh, existed around the country. They built this for observation. Now this is built and the earthwork that's known as the Tower Battery is built on a very narrow spot of the Secessionville Peninsula. That peninsula is about a mile and a half long, uh, but it's uh, kind of a skinny hourglass. It's uh, maybe a half mile wide at its widest point, but right there where the Tower Battery is, uh, the swamps and creeks that border the peninsula converge inward and that the peninsula itself is only about 130 yards wide. So this tower battery is in a perfect position to constrict the movement of any troops that come to attack it. The Federals have made a terrible mistake. They've never done any serious reconnaissance of this area. They don't know just how narrow this thing's gonna get. They don't know just how muddy, swampy the area is just to the sides of the peninsula. All they know at this point is that their initial plan to go across James uh, John's Island, uh, James Island, has not worked, and they are now kind of stuck here, not really able to attack anymore because General Hunter has ordered General Benham not to do that. But the Confederates from Tower Battery and a couple of other places they've got nearby have been shelling General Wright's camp. Wright is shooting back in a limited sort of way, but the Confederates are getting the better of it. Benham now in command, decides he's going to attack the Tower Battery. He comes up with a plan that is not bad in, in terms of the way it's conceived, but he doesn't give the men much time. First of all, it's, this happens on June 16th. At 9 p.m. on the night of June 15th, Benham convenes a meeting with his subordinate commanders. And he tells them at nine o'clock on the night of the 15th, you guys are going to attack the Tower Battery tomorrow morning at three o'clock. He gives them six hours. And this is the first they've heard of it. So they've got to get back to their troops, get these men organized, get ammunition and rations issued, uh, set themselves up in some sort of order of, of march, um, hopefully get the men some sleep and move out at three o'clock in the morning, six hours later. Well, that's not going to happen. They do convince Benham to give them an extra hour. So the the advance doesn't really start until four o'clock. And both of the senior subordinate commanders, General Wright and General Stevens, tell Benham that this is a bad idea. They don't want to do it. This meeting that they have 
uh, later becomes a, a source of some real contention and disagreement. Benham swears that these two officers agreed with him and only asked him to set the, the advance time back an hour. Both of them swear in writing that they absolutely opposed this meeting. Uh, they eventually lost the battle. And when you lose a battle, of course, the recriminations begin to fly. And so there's a lot of blame, blame game being played here. Uh, I tend to side with the subordinates on this because Benham really didn't give them any kind of time. One of the things they did ask that Wright asked him to do was let's delay this until the afternoon of the 16th, get the Navy in on this thing and have them do a bombardment of the tower battery, the area around there, give us preparation here. And Benham dismisses that. He, he never mentions it later. So that says that they didn't do anything like that. All they said was, bump it up to four o'clock instead of three, which isn't true. All right. If you look at map number six, you see the tower battery and then the advance of, of uh, troops. Now, this is troop movements during the course of the day, uh, but you've got, first of all, General Isaac Stevens troops, uh, a brigade under uh, William Fenton, who actually commanded the 8th Michigan, but he's in command of this brigade now, consisting of the 8th Michigan, the 7th Connecticut, the 28th Massachusetts. His troops are the, the tip of the spear. They are to be followed up by General Daniel Leisure or Colonel Daniel Leisure, 79th New York, 100th Pennsylvania, and 46th New York. You see some other troops there to the north of them. Uh, that designates their fighting that actually happens a little bit later. Move to map number seven. And here you'll see phase one of this which starts at four o'clock. The Union troops move out about four o'clock. They're being very, very quiet. It's uh, closer to five when they actually have this. It's not quite dawn yet. A uh, little bit of light in, in, um, in the sky, just, just, just coming to uh, morning. The 8th Michigan is in the advance. Two companies of the 8th Michigan under a Captain Lyons are what they refer to as the forlorn hope. These guys are going to be the first to storm the battery hopefully get over it with the 8th Michigan, the body of it behind them, and then the other units in support to take this battery. Remember, they do not know how narrow the island is here. So when the 8th Michigan forms up, the 7th Connecticut, which really was behind them, is ordered to move to their left. So you've got now essentially a nice long battle line consisting of the 8th Michigan and the 7th Connecticut. As the 8th Michigan makes its initial assault, they make a lot of noise and the Confederates realize they're there. The Confederates actually were asleep uh, when this thing started. They had been working on strengthening the defenses, making the moat in front deeper, the dry moat deeper, piling that up to make the wall higher. They had constructed a, a fairly significant abatis in front of that, uh, but they were asleep. When the Federals came on, and made their charge, the idea was that they were going to be very quiet. They were supposed to have muskets that were loaded but not capped. They were going to depend on the bayonet. They were going to rush the place and make no noise in doing so. But uh, we find out from the record that these two companies of the 8th Michigan, when they made their final charge uh, 50 or so yards away from the, from the uh, wall, they started to yell. And that alerted the Confederates. There were a couple of Confederates there, uh, Captain... Uh, uh, Thomas Lamar, Colonel Thomas Lamar, excuse me, who was up. He had been looking at his men, uh, watching them sleep. He had just given them the opportunity to sleep a little bit. He hears what's going on. He jumps up. And first thing he does is jump up and fire uh, one of the cannons, a 24 pounder that's in, in the front. That just devastates the center of the 8th Michigan's line, pushing them to the right and the left. The 7th Connecticut, which was going to be behind them, has moved to the left they are now in this battle line. Both are moving forward. The 7th Connecticut's moving forward. The 8th Michigan part of it, the, the right part of it, has actually moved to the right to get into some woods. And they accidentally discover a little path that leads around the side of the battery. So within a few minutes after the center of their regiment being blasted, a couple of companies on the right of the regiment have discovered this path, gotten around to the side, climbed up, and they're actually inside the battery, shooting into the rear of the Confederate gunners. And there are not any other Confederates there. They came within a hair's breadth of actually taking the battery right then, within five minutes or so of the initial charge. That doesn't last for a couple of reasons. The 7th Connecticut 
uh, is supposed to advance next to the 8th Michigan, but the 7th Connecticut hits the spot where the island abruptly comes uh, becomes very narrow. And the better part of the 7th Connecticut, the whole leftward side, suddenly finds itself floundering around in the pluff mud, knee deep and deeper in the marsh, and they, they can't go anywhere. That throws the whole line into disarray. By this time, of course, the Confederates are awake. Uh, the our artillerymen are up there pouring artillery fire into the 8th Michigan and the 7th Connecticut. And the, the troops behind them, the 28th Massachusetts, behind the 7th Connecticut, uh, advance a little bit. Some of the men advance forward. Most of them just simply turn and run. But you still have these men from the 8th Michigan who are inside the battery firing into the backs, down along the artillery line and into the backs of some of the artillerymen. And then just as they are about to win this fight, you have one of those Hollywood moments. <clears throat> you know, in the movies, the Indians are just about to overwhelm the fort or, or the settlers and they hear the bugle and the cavalry arrives just in the nick of time. Well, that happens here <clears throat> with some of the Confederate troops. You had part of the 9th South Carolina Battalion and part of the 1st South Carolina Battalion, uh, which were camped a half a mile to three fourths of a mile away. And when the shooting first started, of course, they are awakened. People say, get up, get up, we got to go, and they begin moving. And so they happen to arrive at the fort. This uh, The 9th South Carolina Battalion arrives, comes into the rear of the fort, just as these guys from the 8th Michigan are beginning to come over in some numbers and really pour it onto the rear of the line of Confederate artillerymen. These guys, the Confederates, the 9th South Carolina lined up. They give a heavy volley to the Michiganders who are surprised suddenly to see Confederate troops in front of them. They get pushed back. The South Carolinians push these guys over the wall. And then it devolves into a kind of slugfest, which Patrick Brennan, who wrote uh, really the definitive uh, earlier book on, on this battle um, called Secessionville Assault on Charleston. Patrick Brennan describes it as being a kind of precursor to the fight at the mule shoe at Spotsylvania with men just within feet of each other on opposite sides of a wall, reaching up, shooting over and kind of grabbing and jabbing at each other with their bayonets. Smaller version of the, of the mule shoe. At this point, this is going on, eventually the Michigan guys will be pushed back. But before that happens, the left part of the 8th Michigan and some of the guys from the 7th Connecticut have now kind of hunkered down underneath the guns at the bottom of the other side, the federal left side of the tower battery, and they're picking off the artillerymen looking like they are going to soon be able to make a successful assault. And again, another Hollywood moment, just at that point, the first South Carolina battalion gets in, they move over to their right and they repulse uh, this other attack. By this point, the whole federal assault is in disarray and it, um, it essentially collapses. They fall back. One curiosity about it is that most of the Federals are, are running as you would expect, but Colonel Fenton of the 8th Michigan has his men form up in line and go through the manual of arms very briefly before he turns them around and marches them off the field. The Confederates are so astonished by this that they stop firing and they watch this. Some people have said it's because they're doing it in admiration of a courageous foe. Some have said because they're tired and this is the first chance they've had to take a breather from this fight and they're just, just uh, catching their breath. Either way, the, what's left of the 8th Michigan there kind of falls back in good order and falls all the way back uh, to the reinforcements and to uh, the, the far end of the peninsula, the beginning of the peninsula. Take a look at map number eight. This is phase two. You have the remainder, the other brigade under Colonel Daniel Leisure. That's the 79th New York, the 100th Pennsylvania, and the 46th New York. The 79th New York comes up with the other troops falling back. There is some confusion because they all kind of get mixed together, uh, but they finally sort that out. The 79th New York advances, and the same thing happens to them that happened to the 8th Michigan. It's, it's pretty much a, a, a rehash of, of the 8th Michigan's experience. They come up, they get blasted. The center of their line gets hit hard with Confederate artillery. They move to the right and to the left. The guys on the right discover that path. They work their way around, and they start to get into the the uh, battery again. Uh, the 100th Pennsylvania comes up behind them. Uh, much the same thing happens to them 
that happened to the 7th Connecticut in terms of getting hit by the artillery. They don't move far enough to the left to get bogged down in the, in the marsh over there. Part of the 28th Massachusetts does, however, and they're kind of struggling to get back uh, from their earlier advance. The guys in the 46th New York basically don't get involved. They come up part of the way, they see what's happening, and they just kind of stop, sort of fade off to the left and, and eventually withdraw. So phases one and two of this fight last a couple of hours. It's, it's six-ish uh, by the time the Federals finally fall back. Colonel Isaac Stevens is furious about this. Uh, and he decides, and apparently some of the men are as well, they, they want to try it again. So Stevens gets them lined up. If you look at map number nine, you will see the way the Federals line up again, back away from the narrow part of the peninsula, they are preparing to make another assault. And this is troops from all of the, uh, all of the units which had been involved before, uh, except the 8th Michigan. They're, they're pretty well beaten up. Uh, the, the 46th New York uh, which was known as the Fremont Division. They were Germans uh, uh, who were very much abolitionists and they named themselves after John Charles Fremont. Uh, the Fremonts who had not in, been involved before are pretty much the only fresh regiment. The other three, the 100th Pennsylvania, 79th New York and 7th Connecticut are pretty beat up, but they're, they're in line and they're ready to go. While this is going on, you have fighting to the North. General Wright's troops have arrived but they're not coming on to the Secessionville Peninsula. They're coming on to an area just north of that, and they're thinking they're going to advance parallel to that, be able to move down far enough to flank the tower battery, turn to their right, and then charge across uh, the, the open area in between there uh, and, and take the, the tower battery from the rear. That might have happened, but for two things. One, that 150 or so yards between these two units, I call them the twin thirds, the third New Hampshire infantry, and then shortly thereafter, the third Rhode Island uh, heavy artillery, the, the Rhode Island heavy serving as infantry. They come up, the third New Hampshire does, they get on the flank of the battery, they look across, there's just enough light to where they can see. They must have thought they'd hit the jackpot because there's no Confederates there. On that flank of the battery, there are no Confederates. They start to advance. Very quickly, they realized, like the 7th Connecticut did, that this is not solid ground. They are floundering around knee deep and more in this pluff mud. They can't advance. So they pretty much stay where they are, fall back a little bit to more solid ground and begin to pour a heavy fire, uh, not into the side of the battery because there aren't any troops there yet, but they can see the rear of the artillery line at the front of the battery and they contribute their fire to uh, to. Uh, shooting at the Confederates there. Shortly thereafter, the 4th Louisiana Battalion, which had been involved in a reserve capacity on that June 10th skirmish, shows up and they do line the wall on the Confederate right side of the battery. They begin engaging the 3rd New Hampshire. Um, and there is a just kind of fight at uh, 150 yards range or so, the two units shooting at each other across the marsh, uh, not really accomplishing anything for the Federals. The 3rd Rhode Island heavies had come up behind the New Hampshire boys. They were going to support them, but then they discovered that they're being shot at from their rear uh, by, you see up uh, at the top of the map number nine, uh, the Utah Battalion, which becomes the 25th South Carolina, part of the 24th South Carolina is up there, and a couple, a uh, little bit of the 47th Georgia uh, in support of uh, two guns uh, that the Confederates had mounted half a mile or so away. Well, all of that Confederate force begins firing into the rear of the 3rd New Hampshire and the 3rd Rhode Island, just about the time the Rhode Islanders are showing up. They've got to turn and advance to fight these guys. So you really have a separate battle. There's the Battle of Secessionville at the Tower Battery, and then there is this other action that takes place um, half a mile, three quarters of a mile to the north, involving completely different troops. At this point, Later on, and this, this goes on again for another hour, uh, the Federals are starting to withdraw. The 3rd New Hampshire saw the 3rd Rhode Island withdrawing, realized that they would be cut off, so they began to withdraw, and all the Federal troops push or pull back. At that point, um, it's 8 o'clock, give or take, um, and this fight's over. All the Federals have withdrawn. They back up a little bit farther, 
uh, Isaac Stevens now has his battle line there, which he wants to use. He sends a message to General Benham, who was up with General Wright a little bit to the north, and he, he informs General Benham, okay, we're ready. We're ready to give it another shot. My men are in line. Give us the go. The officer whom Stevens sends to give this information to Benham returns somewhat crestfallen and says General Benham has ordered a general withdrawal. Stevens is furious. Stevens is the best soldier that the Federals have in this whole fight. He really is the guy. He's got the most fight in him. He's got the best strategic sense. He's the one who wanted to take the railroad, uh, the Savannah to Charleston Railroad, when, uh, when they first got there and nobody was listening to him. Um, of course, he is killed not too long after this at Chantilly, uh, following 2nd Manassas uh, up in Virginia. But he's, uh, he's the best they've got here, and he's furious, but orders are orders. Benham has ordered a, a withdrawal, so the Federals pull back. That pretty much ends the fighting, but I want to say just one quick thing about what might have happened. This attack on the tower battery, of course, was not the same thing as the Blitzkrieg that was supposed to happen early on. This was simply done to protect Horatio Wright's camp because he was taking fire from the tower battery. You disable that, then his camp will be safe, which is what Benham told him to do. When uh, I'm sorry, what Hunter told Benham to do when Hunter went back to Port Royal. In the aftermath of this defeat by the Federals, a lot of recriminations. Hunter accuses Benham of violating his orders. Benham says, no, I didn't attack Charleston. I didn't attack uh, um, Fort Johnson. And Benham was right in this. Uh, he did not violate his orders. But he's, with, uh, he's uh, relieved by Hunter. He is sent up to Washington, D.C., um, he is eventually tried and eventually cleared. The adjutant general of the army does a complete investigation of this and, and basically concludes, no, Benham didn't do anything that he shouldn't have done. He did do things he shouldn't have done. He shouldn't have given his guys only six hours to prepare for this fight. He should have listened to his subordinate commanders. Uh, Benham was a crusty sort. He and Stevens knew each other. They had overlapped a couple of years at West Point. Each of them had finished first in his class, Benham in 37 and uh, Stevens in 39. They were some something of rivals, uh, and and Benham. Both of them were excellent engineers. Isaac Stevens was also an excellent infantry officer. Benham was a terrible infantry officer. In any case, uh, he's relieved. He's tried. He's acquitted. He eventually goes back into the army as a lieutenant colonel of engineers and becomes chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac. He's responsible for the the pontoon bridge with which Grant crosses his army over the James. The, all the defenses, or, or rather the trench works around Petersburg, all of that is Benham's work. He's a very, very good engineer, lousy infantry officer. What might have happened? If the Federals had won this battle, being in command of the Tower Battery would have flanked all the rest of the Confederate positions on James Island, which ran in a line roughly from northwest to southeast, culminating in the Tower Battery. They would have been behind all the rest of the Confederate defenses. They would have been within striking distance of Fort Johnson. Had they taken the Tower Battery and then that had, had that been followed up enough, they'd have had Fort Johnson. They would have won. They would have taken Charleston anyway, even though that's what not what they were really trying to do at this point. Uh, so this, had, this was potentially a big deal. If this battle had been won with Charleston immediately threatened by the 16th of June, look ahead a little bit, would... The Seven Days campaigns have been fought, or at least fought the same way. Uh, a lot of would have been a lot of the uh, dynamic might have changed with this. Uh, I will stop there, and uh, we'll take your questions. Thank you.